Greetings Guardians, my name is Byfear. So, Ghosts of the Deep, the new dungeon for the Season of the Deep, dropped yesterday. And I wasn't quite ready for how the dungeon was going to present me with a narrative that was going to blow me away like it did. There are a few caveats to it all, one really big glaring one. But if you want no spoilers for this particular dungeon, you need to leave this video now. If you want the no spoilers first impressions of it, I will tell you this. The new dungeon is excellent. Narratively speaking, at bare minimum, I think it will rank in people's top threes. For many people, probably myself included, it is number one. Narratively speaking, yes, there is an odd twist in there, but it is unquestionably an amazing concept, an amazing story, and it has really interesting nods to all sorts of cool bits of Hive lore. If you haven't played it yet, go ahead and do that now. Although, people like me with a fear of deep water and the things that live in it, yeah, maybe feel free to skip this particular one. Especially if you're creeped out by the location of this dungeon, which is... Um... Yeah. So, that's your first impressions spoilerless version. Let's talk spoilers, and yeah, let's jump in and immediately talk about the premise of the dungeon. The Lucent Hive have taken one of their ships and crashed it deep into Titan's methane ocean near the Arcology. Their objective, unbeknownst to you at the beginning of the dungeon, is to find the remains of the Taken King and resurrect him with a ghost and necromancy. You need to try and stop them and prevent the return of one of our greatest adversaries. The premise for the dungeon, the environmental storytelling, the lore that you find throughout the dungeon, the loot and the lore tabs attached to it, the story behind it, even the bosses themselves and where they're taken from in the lore, this dungeon is dripping in some sweet, sweet lore-filled goodness, and that is what we're all here for. However, before I completely extol the virtues of this dungeon, and there are many of them, we do need to talk about the uh, awkward oryx in the room. When we killed Oryx in the Taken King, and for that matter in the reprised version of King's Fall that we have in D2 today, we see that Oryx floats away in death and distinctly heads towards Saturn. Here in the Season of the Deep we discover that his remains have somehow made their way to Titan. Yeah, this is a problem. The gravity of Saturn is pulling Oryx toward it, and yet somehow the body not only escaped the gravity of Saturn itself, but floated all the way through the asteroid belt around Saturn, the rings, and then made its way past several other moons and landed on Titan's oceans perfectly next to one of the old arcologies that would also happen to be where the Season of the Deep would take place. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting situation. Now, I can accept the incredible cosmic coincidence of Oryx's body landing on Titan if I'd seen him floating out into space, but the fact is that Oryx's body was floating towards Saturn in the first place, and, you know, that makes it just a lot harder to accept it. Slingshotting objects in strange elliptical orbits is a thing, strange coincidences are a thing, and I haven't read into the lore to see if there is a way that the body got to Titan by some other means, but on first examination, this does not make sense. And frankly, this body shouldn't be here. Which means the premise of the entire dungeon shouldn't be here. So, yeah, that's kind of an awkward one. Now, all that being said, I can suspend all of that irritation because even with the knowledge that this really shouldn't have happened, the story premise here is just so seriously cool that I'm kind of okay with it. Because you know what? The rule of cool needs to be employed more. This is an oversight as far as the narrative and the lore is concerned, and I think it is worth mentioning because I think there's only so many times I can forgive things for the rule of cool, especially considering that, well, you know, this is kind of an important, prominent enemy. I guess what I'd say is let's try not to do that particular thing again if we're going to invoke a really cool concept. Again, I've not been able to get through all of the lore of these items and the lore cards attached to the dungeon, so maybe it's explained there. If it is, kudos to Bungie for keeping that in mind. If not, ah, uh, let's try and avoid doing that again because, yeah, people notice these things and it breaks the narrative. And we really don't want to necessarily be doing that unless there's a good reason for it. Anyway, that one rather massive complication doesn't change the reality that the story here is totally excellent. To start off with the stranger human element of the story, the fact that it takes place in the middle of the Arcologies for the first half of the dungeon is a seriously cool choice. 
I think anyone who played Vanilla T2 at the end of the Titan missions saw that big forest in the middle of the Arcology and was like, man, I really wish I could go there. Now we actually get to, and the context of the Hive ritual being conducted by the Lucent Hive at its center is something that only grows more prominent the deeper we go. Of course, I literally mean deeper when I say the deeper we go, seeing as we explore the drilling shaft that's below the Arcology. Whilst it's not clear if this was the same drill that was used to create the borehole that the scientists used to try and cut into the ice and find out what was below it, or if it's just a drill that's designed to allow the anchor points of the Arcology to be attached to the water ice, we can say that this does a great part of selling the scale of the dungeon. It's all well and good when you see the note beneath your map in Deep Dive that says you're 1,000 meters down, ooh. But this... this feels like a 1,000 meters down. It's terrifying, it's ominous, and it feels like a nearly endless descent into darkness. I mean, I'm someone who is not... <laughs> to say I'm uncomfortable in deep water is a bit of an understatement, and seeing this going on... I was on stream with Broman and Glam when I did it for the first time, and I was very uncomfortable. They've done a very good job of selling the idea that you are that deep. And it's, um, yeah, if that's freaking me out, then you've done very well with your terrifying deep water environment. So yeah, the human elements of it are spectacular for helping sell the scale of it, even if it does lead into the terrifying depths. Now, of course, all of this recedes into the Hive suddenly and the uncontested influence that they have, as well as the ominous nonsense that one can find on Titan's sea floor. In both of these environments, I'm sure there's actually a lot for other players than myself to love, but it doesn't go too far out of the way to present a truly novel aesthetic. And you know what? That's fine. It doesn't need to be the case that with every single one of these dungeons, we raise the bar every single time in every single area. But yeah, the hive areas are exactly what you expect, just sometimes they're a little bit drenched. Underwater and on the sea floor is about as terrifying as you can imagine, but if I put all of that aside, I think it's a great exploration of the concept and what it can be. I think it does need the areas where there are air pockets, and those are not just there for the sake of gameplay, it allows you to figuratively and literally take a breath because restrictive movement the whole way through would be kind of monotonous for some, I imagine. For me, though, I'm just glad that I had the ability to run and not be in the pressure test. Oh, let's talk about the pressure aspect for a second, because it's actually more important here than it is in any other activity in Season of the Deep. Bungie could have made the pressure aspect of this really oppressive. And I know that I was sweating by the end of it, because, you know, it really wasn't comfortable for me even slightly, but I can imagine that there are some real masochists out there who would have preferred it if this was an imminent threat and if it was seriously bad the deeper you went. Like, I imagine there are people who would have preferred it if people's heads had realistically imploded upon death because of the extreme pressure. I don't know, this is fine for where Destiny is as far as the tone of everything. I think that the pressure aspect of it is both figuratively and literally in the right place. All that environmental storytelling stuff aside, I think it should be noted that this dungeon does an amazing job with its choice of enemies. Let me explain. This is nothing about a choice of enemy combatant in terms of their actual combat abilities. This is not me saying, yes, we needed another Hive dungeon. Of course, it's all about the enemies themselves, the named enemies, the individuals who have a story here. Of course, the big bad of the dungeon is technically Oryx. His corpse is realistically the main threat without even doing anything, because if he is resurrected then suddenly we need three extra fire team members down here and a whole lot more time to learn some new raid mechanics. But the cool thing is that almost every single one of the Hive bosses here in this new dungeon is a named boss that comes from another part of the game and its story, and they're not insignificant either. Here's an example, you remember this guy? Their leaders belong to you. The rest await extermination. That is Ektar, the Sword of Oryx. We saw him in the Taken King, and we even, in the case of the exotic sword quest, get to fight him and duel him with our own blade. And when we kill him, that helps us as a part of the method to unlock our exotic sword. He died. 
But now, he's been brought back as a Hive Guardian, and instead of the Sword of Oryx, one of the greatest servants of darkness, he's now a Lucent Hive Guardian and is known as Ektar the Shield of Savathun, his blade literally having been replaced with one of the Lucent Hive's Sentinel Shields. Amazing! Utilizing old enemies like this is great because it feeds into the continual mythology of these powerful Hive, and it not only builds these characters into threats in their own right, but also it shows how desperate the situation is. This was one of Oryx's top lieutenants. He is dungeon boss worthy status as far as an enemy is concerned. It's a shame we killed him a second time because I almost wanted him to develop into more of a character, but the point is there's a few of these enemies scattered throughout the dungeon and almost every single one of the named bosses nods to an enemy like this. It's really great, I love this choice, and you know what? Yeah, more like this in future dungeons if it makes sense and if it fits. A great call, absolutely love it. Of course, that's probably something that only lore junkies like myself and a few others would have even noticed, but it's really cool just to see this getting incorporated, because if it does happen over and over again, eventually they become kind of infamous. I imagine that if we ever see Kelgarath again for a third time, there's going to be another change. And having seen him once within the Season of the Lost and then twice within the Season of the Seraph, if we see him a third time and there is another change, it will be reflective of the dominoes continuing to fall. What's going to be the result of him having been given such a powerful weapon and the status as a dark blade and then having failed? Who knows? But that's just an example. Ektar, the Sword of Oryx, is the other great example of this. We've seen the result of those dominoes continuing to topple. And let me tell you, this, this was an awesome outcome for everything. So, yeah. Ektar's presence also speaks to what is probably my favorite part of the entire story of the dungeon, which is how deeply ironic it is. Let me explain. So, here's a few things that Oryx hates. He hates the light, and he hates necromancy. In fact, it's obvious that he hates the light because he's fighting against us and the Traveler, but he hates necromancy in particular to an extent that some people might not know. He hates it because it's against the Hive's concept of the sword logic, and it's considered a deep heresy. In fact, it's such a heresy that when his son Nocris was found having used it, he exiled Nocris and scrubbed his name from all of the Hive's history except for one statue that could not be destroyed. So yeah, Oryx hates the light and Oryx hates necromancy. And so you can imagine what it would have been like if Oryx was able to speak from beyond the grave when he realized that his old right-hand lieutenant, Ektar had been raised into a Hive Guardian, and that he was working with other Hive Guardians, including a Hive Guardian necromancer who were trying to resurrect him. Man, that is some beautiful irony. And let me tell you, I almost want to have failed in the narrative of this. I almost wish that Oryx could have been resurrected as a Hive Guardian, not just because of the incredible possibilities that would have brought, but also because of this. If you look at the potential for Oryx to have rediscovered any of his old memories of his old self via Deep Sight, that would have been one of the most interesting character conflicts I think we could have ever seen. Can you imagine it? Your own existence is the thing that you reviled for billions of years, and now you're back and you have a completely new perspective on life. Crow's conflict when he found out about Aldrin? Interesting, deep, led to a lot of character conflict, so much growth and so much need for realizing who he truly is and the fact that he needs to learn from his mistakes. Imagine the same thing with Oryx. Man, just thinking about that, such an awesome idea. So, yeah, awesome stuff there. Love what's been done here. And you know what? This gets another one of my, hey, that's pretty neat, awards. Kudos to the narrative team for that. Before we move on to talking about the lore collectibles, I think I also need to commend the loot in this dungeon because it ties really well into the fact that these rewards come from a variety of places and yet they make sense. The loot is, well, if you're looking at the weapons at least, clearly equipment from the Golden Age. They're used inside the Arcology for more mundane things. I mean, for heaven's sake, the glaive is a fishing spear. Tell me that choice wasn't deliberate. And clever. Meanwhile, the armor is clearly taken from the Lucent Hive aesthetic and is hinting at the greater objectives of the Hive that have landed here. The entire dungeon leads towards one thing and it's named in the armor. 
It's amazing to sit there and get drops of it, because as we were going through it for the first time, it was our first glaring hint, and man was it cool to see it unfold in the way that it did. Not always something that works, but in this instance, I think Bungie nailed dividing the loot like this. It was a good call. Spot on. Well done, Bungie. Last and certainly not least, though, we've got to talk about the lore collectibles, and by that same extension, we need to talk about Zivu Wrath. The dungeon has lore collectibles which are memories contained in calcified fragments. There are 12 of them throughout the entire dungeon. This? This was a great idea for a collectible series of lore bits, because it calls back to the Taken King and gives us a direct comparison to when we were going around the Dreadnought and finding the pages of the Books of Sorrow. Awesome stuff here. But here and now they don't contain more of the Books of Sorrow, they contain the memories of Zivu Wrath, and I think we have to go ahead and divert here and give a hand to the voice talent behind Zivu, Kimberly Brooks. Not only did she humanize the character of Zivu Wrath, but I cannot imagine a better placed voice and delivery for Zivu. Well acted and well directed, she does a remarkable job of portraying the struggle of Zivu. I won't go into it all here because that's got to be a video all on its own, but suffice to say, this is a spectacular performance and even alongside all of the other incredible story elements here, she totally steals the show for this dungeon. This is like the fragments of memory and duality, but with a far, far greater story impact. Narratively speaking, sure, Callus mattered, but Zivu? Zivu is a way bigger deal. She's not only more powerful in the universe, but she's got a narrative presence that's made her a looming shadow on the story horizon of Destiny for years now. As an extension to our introduction to her, this was incredibly impressive, and frankly, I just have to give a hand to everybody involved here. Also gets a worthy thing of saying, hmm, that's pretty neat. Overall, in summary, yeah, there is a gaping hole in the logic of the dungeon with how Oryx's body actually washed up under the sea here, but everything about this dungeon, aside from that, is top-notch. And again, I'm speaking narratively here. We're not talking about how spongy Ektar is. I think I'm not wrong when I say that in terms of the narrative, the lore, the story, and everything that happens that you can experience in this dungeon, this is probably going to be in people's top threes, if not the number one for story purposes. And I think that here the narrative team has set a new high bar for themselves for what we can expect out of a dungeon. That's only more impressive because of what it means for the future. Bungie's shown here that a dungeon can be a narrative exploration of a compelling concept that not only is relevant to the current content of the season, but also addresses some major questions raised by previous content. People have been asking what happened to Oryx's body for almost seven years now, and heck, now we have an answer. What's even cooler is that when we return to Hawthorne, there are implications that this domino is not the last in the chain. The dominoes are still toppling. Hawthorne doesn't have the clearance to know about Oryx's body being shepherded back to the city by the Hidden. It's being hidden by, uh, well, the Hidden. And that means that we now have the remains of two out of the three major hive gods in our possession. That's not nothing, and I imagine that there are story ramifications there. More importantly, though, it sets up major questions for the future in plot terms. Do the people of the city really want to trust the Guardians and the Hidden when they've brought back the remains of some of their greatest enemies? Even more so a question when some of those enemies do have a means by which they could be resurrected, potentially inside our own borders at that point. And do people really feel safe around the remains of the Taken King? I don't think I would, especially not after what the Lucent Hive attempted here. Even just the knowledge of what happened there. Man, wow. That could be incredible. Anyway, the point is, this has created not only story ramifications in the immediate present, but also narratively this dungeon could have knock-on effects for the future story of Destiny, and I am so excited and so impressed by that. So, overall, this dungeon is a triumph. I think that Regardless of how much water there is, it has the best narrative of any dungeon that we've seen in Destiny, you know? There are definitely calls to say that the underlying narratives that you can see in the Shattered Throne are awesome. Of course, I'm sure that Duality also has the people that particularly enjoy Cabal lore and liked getting a better idea of the true guilt behind Callus. 
and I'm sure that there are other dungeons out there that people really did enjoy. But narratively, this is a new high bar for Bungie, and I am exceedingly impressed. Go ahead and play it. I'll be making tons of lore videos on it. And as I explore the lore of the weapons, armor, lore collectibles, enemies, and more, those videos are going to release over the next few weeks on the channel, alongside all of the other content from Season of the Deep. But in the meantime, those are my first impressions, and that is it for our video today. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and leave a like. If you want more video content, go ahead and hit subscribe, and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. And of course, if you have your own thoughts, leave them down below in the comments section. But as per usual, know that your viewership, as always, is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Porodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.